Hi, good morning. I'll try to, uh, I'll, I tell you what, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Ebola and stuff, and, and then I'm, I assume there's lunch and I'll be around because I'm going to eat. And I know if I've sat in a meeting all day, like you all have, it's lunchtime. Our stomachs tell us that. But first, let me say, I work for the Knowledge Charleston Health Department. We also cover Putnam County. Uh, we provide services in that county. I am a registered nurse. I've done clinical services. Now I do infectious disease and um, threat preparedness. And let me just commend all of you that volunteer your time um, to serve your fellow man. I, I can't speak enough to how much that is appreciated. Um, I had an opportunity several years ago to go to McDowell County in those floods and, and set up some medical services down there. And it's the people on the ground like you uh, that really make recovery happen. Uh, you know, we come in, we're public health, we're uh, responsible for the health and medical response. Also, like in the water crisis, water contamination for environmental, that was a huge role uh, for the health department. But then, especially in these natural disasters, these agencies go away. And it's you people, I, I sometimes think you're the best kept secret in West Virginia because I was listening to the last presentation and I had no idea how active uh, your organizations were. So uh, once again, I commend you for that. <coughs> Let me just say, if I sound a little rattled, uh, last two days I've just, counting driving up here, spent 800 uh, miles on the road. And one of those, my last meeting was in Indiana where uh, groups were talking about the water crisis. Uh, it was at Purdue University. Several of the uh, citizen action groups were there. Uh, and it, probably like you all, the water crisis goes away, it's flush, and uh, you know, the counties affected go on. And there's been a lot of promises that were made that uh, we want to see happen. And one of those was long-term monitoring, which was uh, in Senate Bill 373 that the Bureau for Public Health would provide long-term monitoring. Uh, I know our health officer, Dr. Gupta, and DHHR secretary has even traveled to Washington to try to get support for that. Um, also trying to get funding through CDC. We haven't seen that funding yet. Um, hopefully that will happen. There's also a lot of work in trying to protect the water systems. And as bad as it is, sometimes it takes a crisis for people to open your eyes. Um, you know, we, we live in the Chemical Valley, so we worry about um, chemicals. In fact, our LEPC was one of the first um, in the nation because of the chemicals that uh, were present in, in the companies and um, you know we we exercise shelter in place evacuation but in no way had we really dealt in my 17 years in public health and Stan is back there it, with a water crisis and a do not use and a chemical contamination of a water system uh, it, and when I look back I say why is that because you know, these are things that happen. It's not what you always drill for, but the fact that agencies work together, no matter what happens, we're all working as a team, and I think that's very valuable. I don't have a presentation, but I can answer some questions about Ebola. Um, when this first started and the gentleman from West Africa was diagnosed in Dallas, it's been huge. Is there anybody here who doesn't hasn't seen Ebola on the news? Because if so, if you don't live in America. Um, today we've had that one gentleman who died, uh, several healthcare workers affected, uh, no one traveling on a plane, although I've been called several times. Um, as has many health departments because people don't realize, I wish I'd brought my slides, but I don't have much time, 
the countries affected. Here's, here's the big picture. Here's Africa. Here's the countries right here that are affected. And uh, the big concern right now, um, in fact, as much as public health and CDC has been criticized, I think when you look back, there's been a, a lot of excellent work done. Uh, a few mistakes, something new happens, like I said, we're not always on top of it. But um, I think the federal guidelines from CDC has come down and I think we're all pretty much on the same page with that. What we did in Kanoa County was organize a task force. We got our emergency responders. Uh, this was several weeks ago when um, we were just hearing it on the news and wasn't really sure how that would affect um, West Virginia. So we went ahead and got everybody together. We made an alert system. Um, if we needed it, uh, a way for our 911 system to, to really be alerted and alert hospitals and public health um, if we did have a suspect case. So I think there's been a lot of work. It may not be Ebola next time. There's a lot of emerging infectious diseases that we don't see here in our nation that are out there, that are playing right away. So our next step is, is a monitoring plan. Um, we're working on, if anybody does come to our region, and I'm sure other health departments are aware of this, CDC um, has guidance that if it is a high-risk person from that country exposed to someone with Ebola without using proper, proper uh, personal protective equipment, we will monitor those people for 21 days. If they're high risk, we're going to set some limits for uh, uh, travel. Where the, you know, but if they're high risk, not everybody is high risk. Even the people coming from those countries, the healthcare workers now um, should be using the appropriate personal protection uh, equipment to to um, to almost eliminate them from being exposed. So I think. A lot of those place of things are now in place um, and they're being put in place not just in Kanoa and Putnam County but across the state. The Bureau for Public Health is, has, um, is working on a plan too, I think statewide. I haven't seen that. Have you all, Stan? I've been out of town for a few days. Um, but even if um, we don't get the guidance from the states, the local health departments are working on that. They know the questions to ask, so it's not something I feel like we need to fear. Um, but it could happen. Uh, you know, it could be an exposure, it could be a person traveling, all that systems are in place now. It took a little while to get that all to come together, so I feel pretty secure that there's enough public health system in place on the federal, state, and local level that we know what to do. And if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer those. Um, also, contact if you have questions, contact your health department at any time because that's what we're all here for. We answer a lot of questions on infectious disease, environmental health. Um, whatever clinical uh, vaccinations that's what we do we also have a, our own volunteer organization and, um, for public health emergencies and I would really Gina and I've been talking about how that the whole system can work so we can all be more effective in in, in working together and please if you have anything that uh, you think public health should be doing or that we can do better I, I you all are doing a great job. I've been on the ground for a lot of years. We can learn from you. I've got a lot of several new employees that are trying to um, work with volunteers and, and get things established. So we can learn a lot from, from you guys who've been doing it for a lot of years. So we'll take any input that you have. I'll take any questions that you might have about any public health I issue. If I can't answer it, I'm gonna look at Stan from Beckley Raleigh Health Department and get the answer. So um, I'm available at lunch. 
I'm here. If anybody's got anything pressing right now, I'll be glad to answer that. Is some of your information on your website, on the website? Yeah, uh, yes, I can put, um, we have a website that, can I write on, is yes, it? Yes, yes. On the bottom of this? Yes. Every health department has a website. Um, ours is available. Uh, also, the Bureau of Public Health has one. Um, I don't know. I always dot gab. If you go to DHHR website, you can find that. In fact, they put out some good guidance for us. Uh, CDC. If you ever have a question on preparedness or infectious disease and you want to just look it up on the internet, uh, www.cdc.gov is pretty much the go-to organization. In fact, most of our information links to the CDC page. Uh, all of our plans uh, link to the guidance because H1N1, anybody remember H1N1? Yes. <laughs> you know, we look for them for guidance. Sometimes, like I said, sometimes it's a slower when emergencies or something emerges. They want to get the appropriate guidance out, but they, they do have uh, specific information for hospitals, public health, <coughs> EMS. So if you have any questions, those are probably the two uh, references that I would refer you to. Well, this is Kanoa, Charleston. We also have Putnam. Uh, your local health department, if you type in Beckley Raleigh Health Department, you should be able to get uh, that or whatever county you're in. Anything else? You were? Yeah. I still have the same question, but maybe everybody knows it but me. But what are the like basics of Ebola? Like incubation period? And oh, how contagious it is? And okay. What it does? <laughs> Quickly. Um, Ebola um, used to be called, we still call it viral hemorrhagic fever. Uh, it is spread somehow through animals, uh, kind of like uh, some flu is spread from animals to person. I'm not sure they've ever figured out exactly what the transmission, how that happens or how animals get affected. I can tell you in these African countries and you know, Asia and overseas, a lot of times it's through uh, like flu, uh, avian flu, through birds, chickens, a lot of uh, exposure to that, um, bats, I'm not sure which animals, there's several reservoirs which are animals that they think started. Um, as far as for persons to get that, um, Ebola, Usually, if you're exposed to Ebola within 21 days, you're, if you're going to get symptoms, you will experience those. Usually, it's 8 to 10, but we, we have our guidance in 21 days. If you're exposed uh, uh, well after 21 days, then you're cleared. Uh, we go the furthest out for incubation, which is the amount of time from the exposure to the time that you could develop the d disease if you're going to. Um, <coughs> It's, is it contagious? It's not as contagious as the flu, and that fact uh, is for the reason that it's not airborne like TB or, or flu or respiratory. This, the, it's contact with someone's body fluids. Uh, that could be something as simple as sweat, saliva, uh, vomit, feces. So you have to have, and then that's kind of why we see the people taking care of these. Uh, in fact, it spread so rapidly in Africa because, uh, excuse me, and that's, in that culture, they buried their own people. So as people died in that country from Ebola, there was a, a, a ritual of how they, other people in the families and the, and the um, communities 
would cleanse the body and prepare it for, for burial. Um, and that's where they saw a lot of transmission. Of course, they didn't have the system for isolation in those hospitals. They didn't, I, I, they're working on that. You've seen the government and the military's going over there. I'm hoping to build up, they're building up a better infrastructure, isolation, containment facilities. Um, it's a sad, tragic thing that public health for what, sometimes we don't appreciate how many uh, things we have in place that aren't available in other uh, countries. Um, we at first were kind of feel fearful that people would kind of what I want to call it, escape, come to America or other countries and spread it. Uh, they have systems in place at their airports. Um, we have systems in our international airports that bring people from those countries overseas. Um, now that if they're they're actually doing a better job of monitoring, if they're not symptomatic but they're traveling and have had high risk exposure, then public health is going to monitor. They're going to alert the state health department and the local health system to keep an eye on the people for for those 21 days since they left the country. Did that cover? Yeah, it's like I said. It's not as contagious. You not being in a room with somebody um, is is not going to put you at risk. It will be people taking care of those people, EMS system, hospital system, um, people that are actually at risk for touching body fluids. We've had nobody on airplanes uh, get sick. They've monitored from people that travel. There was a lot of scare with that. I think it's more realistic as we educate the public and, and people are more aware of how that's transmitted. I've been called to the airport. I've been called by hospitals where airline uh, <coughs> personnel thought they had it. None of those uh, really panned out to be anything. Um, you've got to remember to get the word out realistically, read up on these things if you don't know, or refer them to, your, to the health department because um, it's kind of consumed our life for the last few weeks and we need to be ready. It could happen in any county, so uh, we're there, we're doing our, we hope we're doing our best to, to prevent things like that from spreading. So. Um, that answered your question. I have nothing else unless you all have questions. I'll be around. Oh, go ahead. I just have a question because I'm thinking of the woman here in America that refused to be quarantined. Was she probably not high risk? I don't know. I didn't keep up with that. And can somebody refuse to be quarantined? Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, the woman was not symptomatic. Uh, someone has, yeah, has to be symptomatic to be at risk. Yeah. Uh, some people had traveled. There was a lot of worry that it was someone who developed, a, developed actually it was a healthcare worker that developed, not the case you were, but the case in Ohio had traveled and the 21 days is up and no one that she was around or in her family got Ebola. Because you have to be exposed to the body fluids for other symptomatic. We are looking at, the woman there has uh, lived out her 21 days quarantine she had no um, known uh, breaches in personal protective equipment. She would probably not be considered only, we would still probably set up uh, the thing as a monitoring system, but we're not going to limit their travel unless they become symptomatic. Now, if she had said, <coughs> I got vomit on me or I was exposed, I didn't have the right PPE on, then she would become high risk. Quarantine, there are quarantine laws that's left to state and local health departments. We've used those uh, for TB is, is one of the examples I can tell you that uh, we've done before. If someone has TB and they're out running around, we don't have a place to keep the, you know, I've had people that lived in shelters and dormitories develop TB and actually have the disease. We've had to put those in uh, state hospitals while they were contagious. So there are quarantine laws. We want to make sure we're following the guidelines. We don't want to quarantine someone who's low risk or someone who's not sick. So that's why 
if a high risk person comes in, we're going to monitor them twice a day by phone and a person and a visit. We're going to make sure that we know and they know they will reach us if they get symptoms. So the system's better. I, I, I foresee it working. I won't say we won't get other cases because I don't know a lot about travel as far as we know there will be health care workers going over and coming back. So we're going to watch those especially. And if anybody living in those three countries, um, we're going to really make sure they're monitored for the 21 days. Yes, sir. Do the water treatment plants stop anything like that if it gets in the water? Well, anything that, any infectious disease that um, has gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea, um, in fact, I don't think there was ever a risk. You know, we have salmonella, we have uh, a lot of um, bacteria that can be transported through the sewer system. Um, that has never been a problem. I stand to you. I don't, I think that was a lot of worry that people just didn't know enough about it. So, you know, the, it's a category one for us, which is the highest level that we, if we have a viral hemorrhagic or Ebola case. Um, so we're learning more about that every day. We've got, you know, any waste are considered hazardous waste. So right now, unless that changes, we're going to follow the guidelines. Um, this is not the first outbreak of this. It's been contained, and this is the largest. But there has been Ebola in the African countries before. So there is a little history with it. There, they do have people researching this. We're learning more about it every day. So, um, you know, for the latest information, I'm going to once again refer you to CDC, not CNN. Okay? <laughs> do you want to add anything, Stan? No, I think that covers most of it. And maybe Stan, if <coughs> we, we have a questionnaire that we ask our patients, and if you go down through that, you eliminate the flus and things. Yeah. You need to have that exposure to come from those tests. And you know, we have now some of the hospitals may be getting the tests, or at least an initial test, kind of like we did with H1N1. Uh, they can not, it's that's in the pike where if there's an exposure, but I want to warn everybody that this test will only be done if it's approved probably through public health that we have an actual risk. We can't have everybody with flu symptoms, GI symptoms, coming to be tested for Ebola who's never been out of the country or rode in a plane. So we're going to look at that very cautiously to make sure that the people that are at risk are, are high risk are the ones that we're going to monitor. Okay, did that answer that question? Yes, thank you. Thank you.